Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I am thrilled to be here today with Melissa Mulligan from Music Career Mastermind. And just that name gets me excited, like talking, I feel like we're going to have a little music career mastermind here today because both of us, you know, have worked with indie artists for years and giving them support and helping them, you know, with guidance on their career. So I cannot wait to get into all of this stuff. I love goal setting. I love time management, productivity, income streams, all the stuff that I know Melissa also loves. So we're going to get into that. But first, I would love for our audience to know more about you, Melissa. Like, how did you get started working with musicians? Kind of what's your what's your story arc to get to where we are today? Yeah, the origin story. Yes, the origin story. (laughs) I love it. Well, yeah, I think we do have a lot in common there, Bree. So um, I for sure have always been a singer and a songwriter and an artist. I did the indie artist thing. In the early aughts, you know, I at one point was playing 200 shows a year. Um, I also ran a a little radio show for a few years with a friend of mine called the Songwriter Circle. And I was always obsessed with vocal training and vocal coaching and just the human voice in general. Mm -hmm. So I found my way into vocal coaching while I was performing full time. It was a nice supplemental income, you know, those multiple revenue streams, you know, Um, (laughs) but I also really loved it. And I recall one day, you know, I had played a solo show out by myself and, you know, you're having to put up with being flirted with by the venue manager in order to get paid at two in the morning and you're carrying speakers out of the back door in your heels going, this is not my dream, right? This is not my dream for this $200. (laughs) And the next day I was exhausted. I did not want to teach. And this young, young girl, maybe 10 or 11, ran in from the rain with the biggest smile on her face and hugged me and said, this is the best hour of my week, every week. And I was like, oh crap, I think I like this better than what I did yesterday. I'm gonna be one of these people, I know it. I was like, I'm not ready, but I know I'm gonna be one of these people that has a second act to their career that they love even more than the first act. I just, I felt it in my bones and I was almost mad, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Like, I know I'm not gonna be touring in my forties. I know it, you know? But so that that was me. I I fell in love with vocal coaching. I still played for, for years after that, but I started to become really popular in the recording industry in New York and LA and Nashville because I'm such a contemporary music obsessed coach you know like i've trained with opera trainers i've trained with musical theater people but i am not an opera person i am not a musical theater person like i like pop punk emo hip-hop like metal you know country i like i like contemporary vocals so much and there aren't a lot of us in the field who prefer it Mm. you know who are obsessed with how do you get that cry in your voice or that grit or that lilt or that Billie Eilish whisper in your head voice? Like there aren't a lot of people who like that's their world. And I believe that artists who sing hard and weird deserve really healthy voices too, without having to alter their signature sound. So that became my my real entry point into working in the music industry. Um, which I still do regularly, you know, tour prep and studio work with signed and touring artists. Um, And through that work, 
I started having these amazing conversations with labels, managers, producers, songwriters, experts, and everybody was complaining at me. Oh, young artists today, they don't understand that they have to do this, or they don't understand artist development. They think they're ready before they're ready. They, you know, they, and I'm thinking, well, yeah, but they're out there and they don't have access to you. They don't have access to these conversations. You know, they don't, and with the birth of Spotify and streaming and social media happening all around that time, I was like, man, what are these artists gonna do? They're gonna figure out how to market themselves, build a following, tour independently, pay for it all, and figure out what makes them special and unique and authentic and what they need to work on musically all at the same time. Like that's just, that's not gonna happen. So that is when I roped some of my colleagues in to form Music Career Mastermind. We started that in 2017 to be like holistic, soup to nuts, one place where you are working on every aspect of your artist development from your music production skills to your songs, your artist identity, what business model you want to operate under, you know, fan generation and all that. Yes, but that's really a strategy to help you get where you want to go. Like you were saying, the goal setting and getting really clear on your vision. So that's how that's how it all came together. A bit of a squirrely journey. Oh, I love it. And I love the whole, the second act thing. And I love that story about the, the little girl. Like it just, I feel the same way. I just met with my, I call them my OG group because they're the original Academy members. Um, I started back in 2015 and I still meet with them separately because they all know each other so well. And, and I just love keeping up with them. And it makes me feel like, wow, everything that I've done, you know, is it, it, the ripple effect, right? And so it, um, it's just kind of the, just that feeling like, wow, I'm able to have an effect so beyond myself when I work with other people. And, and that's kind of what you experienced in that, in that day on, in the, in the vocal studio. That doesn't yeah. mean that we're giving up what, you know, the performing, right? I'm glad you said you still did that. And yes. I still did that too. Because yeah. you still need to have your foot in that because otherwise you might completely lose touch with what it is that you're trying to work with your students on. 100%. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. I hold myself accountable to still write, record, perform. I mean, it's when I, it's when I can and when, it, when the spirit moves me. But yeah, I try really hard to make sure that I don't lose that vulnerability yep. <laughs> that we're all asking our artists to have that we work with. Yeah. yeah. But on the other side of that, I have to say, when you get busy and when you get popular and people are seeking you out for this stuff, you don't have a ton of time for that. So the fact that you can do it a few times a year, cool, that still means that you are, you know, keeping your foot in the game. But I, I guess sometimes I feel like artists are like, well, I only want to work with someone who's in the trenches. And, you know, they re but they're in if they're really in the trenches, they don't have time to help you. You know, they're focused on their thing. So I think there's that balance, but really we do need to keep our, our foot in the game a little bit, but obviously our, our focus is now how we can pass it forward and, and help other people. Yeah, 100%. I mean, and I've, you know, as an, as an indie artist, yeah, I was in the trenches, but I was not in the trenches as a signed artist. I am now with my signed artists, right. you know, so I can speak to, you know, what's happening in the industry and the trends that I'm seeing because I'm in it. Um, and there's no way that I could do both. No way. no way. No. So what, what you do in Music Career Mastermind, it sounds a lot like, like A&R that people don't get because they don't have labels and they don't have budgets for artist development and that kind of thing anymore. And, and you're right. It's like, well, what did these artists now have access to the things that they didn't have when, when they had to wait around for a label to pick them up, they can get their song out there tomorrow on Spotify, but yet they're missing this big piece, right? And of course they're going to do that. Like, why not do that? But then they might, you know, realize this isn't working because I haven't really thought through all the the stuff, the branding stuff, the, the, the repertoire stuff, that kind of stuff that you guys are helping them with. And even like the business side, which is what I help with. Um, right. So what do you see as kind of, some of the biggest things that people come to you with that 
they need help with or like misconceptions about how they should be working in the industry? Oh man, what, what a great question. I, well, there's so much, I think I often see artists who want to release every idea they have as soon as they have it. <laughs> um, and you know, the way that, that a business like management or a label or anybody does it right. As you know, music will get held for a while until you actually have a strategy and a purpose and some measurable results results that you're looking to get i also see just a lot of misconceptions around why people why artists feel they need to be active and successful on social media mm -hmm. you know you know uh, the first conversation if you ever reach out to me anyone listening ever reaches out to me and asks for feedback, you're not gonna get it. You're gonna get 10 questions. Hear me like, what do you think of this? And I'm gonna be like, where do you wanna go with it? What do you think you wanna do? You know, I'm a, such a questioner, but you know, people will say to me, okay, Mel, my goal is to build engagement on all platforms. And my question is, to what end? Yeah. For what purpose? What business model are you operating under? What's the goal? Are you, are you like, somebody who wants vanity metrics because you think it's going to make a label come running to you? Is it because you've heard a bunch of YouTubers and TikTokers tell you that the only way to have a career is to build a fan base? What do you want to do with that fan base? Do you want to magically monetize it? If so, how? What's on the other side of that strategy? Because it's really a strategy and a tactic to build engagement. It's not a result in and of itself. So I think that's the main thing that I see today is that artists are like trying to get tips and tricks as to what to do to get results, but the dots aren't being connected, you know, because there are so many options and there are so many different goals that everybody has. Yeah. Yeah. And I definitely want to speak to that for a second, but I did want to mention what you were saying about how artists want to throw everything out there as soon as it's you know, as soon as they create it, as soon as it leaves their brain. And uh, it's a good point that you said about regular businesses, like there is an R&D department and they are, you know, researching and doing all these things to create. Some of those products never go to market because yes. they just realize, you know, they've done their research and they realize it's just not a good fit, or maybe they just could never hone it the way that they wanted to for different reasons. And so, you know, you need to be that way with your songs, right? Like, have I really gotten enough feedback on this song? Is it exactly the way that it should be? You know, do I have an audience for this kind of song, that kind of thing before you you release it? But then like what you were saying about, about what artists motivation is. And I find as I help artists, you know, my my brand is Profitable Musician, right? It's like, there's different levels of that. It's, do you want to make a living with it? Do you want to just recoup the money that you spend on your very expensive hobby? Do you want to do this part-time while you also teach? And, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I also find that sometimes their motivation isn't money up front. Their motivation is they just want people to listen to their music and, and, and enjoy it and, yes. you know, want to share it with other people. Do you find like, where, where do you find people are on the spectrum of like, I want, it's more important for me to have my music heard and, and loved by people versus wanting to make money with it. Obviously kind of need to make money to keep going, but. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, Brie, but I would say an overwhelming majority of the artists that I work with, at the heart of it, the primary motivation is not the finances. Mm -hmm. You know, the primary motivation is being a part, being a member of the club, you know, being a music maker that is respected, that is valued, that has found their audience. And, you know, also, they would not like to have a desk job or sling pizza, thank you very much, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so the necessity is, I don't wanna do anything else but this, I want this to be my life, and therefore I need to figure out a way to monetize it, you know, and make a living. But I think it's more just the desire to live the life of someone who makes music and be seen and heard and valued um, is I think the primary motivation, you know? So there are definitely people I work with who are like, you know what? I've got a day job. I don't hate it. I don't care about the money. Just help me get out there. 
help me book, mm -hmm. help me figure out a way to get some shows and get an audience and whatever happens, happens. And then certainly I would say, you know, most of the younger artists I work with are hoping to avoid that fate, you know, mm -hmm. to them, they're like, that is not what I want. <laughs> I want all of my money, you know, all of my, my revenue to come from music in some form or other. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I think when I first started this business, I thought it was all about let's make a living from music. And as I worked with artists, I discovered that it's more about, like you said, the legacy, the one wanting to be part of the club. I like that, how you said that. Um, just knowing that what you do matters to other people. Yeah. And following your purpose. And you need the money to finance that. And that's kind of what I, I mean, yeah, my, again, my brand is profitable musician. I think to some people they're like, ah, I don't want to be a profitable musician because that's like, yeah, that's corporate or whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's yeah. not, it's not cool and bohemian, but <laughs> the point is we need money in this world to keep doing the thing we want to do. Right. Right. And so I think that I've, I've also discovered that yes, it's a secondary motivation, but unfortunately it is a necessary motivation. Yeah, I think it's a secondary motivation until it becomes a primary motivation for whatever reason, mm -hmm. <laughs> until it, you know, until lack thereof starts to eat away at your ability to even participate in, in the craft. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you kind of focus on like career diagnostic. Like you said earlier that you, if someone reaches out to you, you ask them 10 more questions. Um, and so what are the kind of the things you did mention them a little bit earlier, but what are kind of the main things that you're trying to figure out in this diagnostic to see like where kind of where their career goals need to be in order to get where they want to go? Yeah, that's great. Well, I, I definitely I start by really making sure I understand the artist's values, which is some of what we're already talking about, you know, mm -hmm. being seen, being heard. Um there are, you know, there's many different types of values as possible, whether it's financial stability or freedom, like bohemian travel lifestyle, family, artistic integrity, social justice, political mm. commentary, um, anti-capitalism, full-on capitalism. I mean, every artist, you know, comes to me with a different set of values that I really want to honor inside of that conversation. Um, and then, yeah, I really like to discern what the unicorn jumping over the rainbow dream is. Like if you could totally control the outcome, where's your story going? Where's the storybook? you know, ending or, or next level, you know, um, chapter ending for you. Um, and then we start to dive in. Then I need to understand, okay, how soon do you need to monetize this? Do we have time, right, to invest time and or funds in the longer term vision? Or is there a short term need? Because sometimes the activities that are easily monetized are not aligned with an artist's long-term vision, mm -hmm. right? Your long-term vision is to tour as an original artist, but you're spending all week playing at a piano bar, playing covers at a piano bar because you got to pay the bills. You, your long-term vision is to, you know, you're 18 and your long-term vision is to get signed by a label and therefore your tactics need to be largely digital and online, but you're playing a ton of local gigs and trying to sell CDs so that you could make a hundred bucks or 200 bucks at the gig. So these are things that'll take you sideways if you're thinking I need to monetize now, you know? Um, so we talk about that and then we start to talk through the various pathways that could lead you to really want to go We'll explore all those together, see which ones really light you up, what skills you need to build, really big on artists, at least being their own producers. You don't have to become Pharrell Williams, but you've got to participate. You've got to be really, really at least intermediate level in a DAW. So if you're not, I'm going to make sure you do that. Yeah. And then we just start to unpack the skills and the next steps. And I sort of lay out a couple of different options and then we're off and running. So I'm curious what you said about home production. Is that 
so they can self-release or is that so they can get their songs from idea to something that a producer can understand well enough to, to do what they want to do in the studio? Both of those and then a couple other reasons. Uh, definitely most artists will need to write, record, and release regularly for a long time. Mm. It's typically not financially sustainable to continue to have to hire other people yeah. to write, record, and release regularly for years, you know, while you're building up to, to real money coming in. Um, I also love it for creative control slash contribution as you're developing your sound and you're figuring out who you are. It's very practical if you want the industry to be interested in you, because they're going to be like, I loved what you did. Oh, someone else produced that? Well, can I hear your demos? Like, what's your vision? Let me hear your portfolio. Mm -hmm. I need 30 more songs. You know, today the industry pretty much expects you to be pretty solid in a DAW. Mm -hmm. I love it to collaborate and build your network. Somebody hits you up to be a guest vocalist, <laughs> you know, yep. they're going to send you stems and want you to participate. It's just the way of now, you know, and I, I see the, the lack of technical comfort holding a lot of really amazing artists back and it's not rocket science. So I'm a big, big, if you work with me at all and you're not on a DAW, you will be because there's just no reason not to get comfy in it, in my opinion. Mm. And, and is there a specific one you recommend? Do you like Logic? I'm, it depends on what type of music you're making and where you're comfortable and what type of computer you have. I mean, if you're on a PC, we see a lot of Ableton and FL Studio. Um, some That's what I work. use. <laughs> Yeah, some old schoolers still have Pro Tools. Um, if you're on a Mac, Logic Pro for sure is super versatile. Um, but you know, why not learn more than one as well? They're all good at different things. Mm, that's cool. And, and I love what you said about them being able to use that to be creative and, and explore their sound and and have that. I, I, I kind of did that, I'd say it, but like way back in the you know, early tooth, early aughts, like you said, you know, yeah. and I realized I built a lot of relationships by doing that and be like you said, just being able to pump out a harmony vocal real quick for someone as a favor. And then, you know, then they might think of me next time when someone says, hey, do you know anyone that can do this or that? And, you know, that's how I got some demo jobs and then eventually found a producer and, you know, so many things that just kind of snowball that you don't realize will just because you can record from home. Yes. And then when you're collaborating with other producers, because likely, ideally, at some point, you're not having to hire someone and then just trust what they say. But when you're working with other producers, no matter how famous or successful they are, you can speak the language, you know, mm. you can say, oh, you know, like, there's a little bit too much delay on that, or, <laughs> you know, too much decay on that reverb, or whatever, you know, you can actually speak the language and take yourself seriously in the room. And yeah. not just be like, uh, I guess you're the expert. So even though I don't think I love this, I don't know how to steer it in the right direction. So I'll just let you go ahead. Oh, and then later you're just annoyed because you didn't, yes. you didn't speak up and now you feel like this sound is not really you. I definitely had some friends that that happened to because they're like, well, but this producer knows so much more than I do. But yeah, they're trying to mold you into something that's whatever the sound of the day and that's not you. And then you're just going to be mad when you listen to that recording every time because you're going to feel like it's not you and and right. you know and then you've you've kind of wasted that segment of your career so yeah you got to learn how to speak up yes Ugh. well let's kind of segue into since we're talking about the studio um and recording i know that you have have a ton of experience helping musicians with their their vocals in the studio or home studio or wherever they are i do yeah. think that recording is so much is there's definitely a difference in how you sing and, and technique and stuff like that in recording versus live. What, what have you found that is the most helpful when you're working with artists to try to help them understand like the differences between live singing and recorded singing? Oh man, what a great question. You're asking me great questions, right? <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> um, okay. When you're recording, it's not 
a recital. You know, it's not, <laughs> it's not capturing the way you normally do it live. It is its own work of art. You know, and, and I often say it's, it's sort of the acting metaphor would be like, if you've ever done anything on stage as a kid and they're like, you've got to go big and you've got to project to the back wall because you got to sell it. Well, compare that, compare like middle school or high school theater camp to, I don't know, a movie scene between like, you know, James Dean and Robert De Niro, right? Like two, two actors who can just move an eyebrow or an eyelash and you understand what they're thinking and what they're feeling. I mean, recording vocals is this very, very nuanced mm. art form. And it's not about singing. It's about you making the hair on someone else's arm stand up. It's about you making someone else's heart leap out of their chest or stop beating for a second. And you're not going to get that if you're showing how well you're singing, you know, if that's not what's going to move people, you know, I'm not saying that you can't belt it out or have something gritty, but it's really difficult, I think, for singers to stop worrying about pitch, chest voice versus head voice, like am I belting versus am I flipping, technique if you've been trained, am I singing this well or, or right, and to really, really make sure that the lyric and the feeling mm -hmm. and the rhythm in the pocket are all coming through. Does that make sense? It does. And, and that is, that is so true. And, you know, on the flip side of that, I'm always telling artists because they think that when they're performing, they want, they need it to sound just like the recording. And I'm like, if they wanted to hear the recording, they'd turn that on. Like they're coming for a totally different experience, but I haven't really talked about the opposite. And that is so true. There's so many opportunities for nuance and, and getting emotion across in a very subtle way in the studio that you can't do live. Yeah. And, and even if you can, great, but, but it's not the purpose. It, the recording isn't about you. It's about the <laughs> recording. Does this work of art convert somebody's heart and, and mm -hmm. transport them into a different space and time? It's not about your vocal is the vehicle, but it's not really about, but your vocal isn't the destination. <laughs> I just made that up. How's that? No, I like that. It's so you're saying it's more about the song than it is about the vocal. Yeah, the song and and the the record as a whole, like how everything in the record, the instrumentation, the beat, the the vibe of it, how is that all working together to make somebody feel something, to really transport them. And it is something that's going to be played over and over and over again, not like a live performance, which hits you at 60 miles an hour. And then that's it. That's your experience, you know? Yeah. Which is, I mean, honestly, why there is a different copyright for a master versus the song itself, because that master is its own work of art and, and people can do yes. one song so differently. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Ugh. So I, uh, how do you work on things like I know for me, especially as a home recorder, like I've had trouble with blowing out the microphone, you know, if I want to be able to really belt, like, are there techniques on being able to do that in a recording space? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, typically what I would do is I would have you, you know, show me your setup, show me what you're doing. Let me kind of hear you in real time and we would figure it out because sometimes it's audio interface optimization and what mic you're using and how, you know, all of that and what's the room look like. Um, but of course, you know, there are the tricks of giving yourself more space from the microphone or, you know, turning your mouth to the side um, or even belting with half as much intensity as you think you need to in mm. order to get the intensity to really come across in the record. Hmm. And I know you mentioned earlier about there's not nearly as many people focusing on the contemporary vocal sound. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was classically trained. So same experience. Like I always loved contemporary music. And sometimes it was so hard to translate what I had learned in the vocal studio 
into a contemporary sound. Um, do you work with a lot of singers that are a little bit stuck in those classical ways? Yes, classical and also the musical theater mm -hmm. tradition. Um, it's just, uh, it's, it's apologize if you can hear the Manhattan sirens. I am on the 16th floor and they still can get so loud. Wow. Um, yeah, it's just sort of the tradition of vocal coaching, isn't it? It comes from that bel canto and then mm -hmm. the Broadway um, style. So yes, a lot of singers get stuck with extra vibrato where it's not deliberate or necessary stylistically. It's just kind of masking pitch or helping mm -hmm. you hit a higher note. It, um, as And that can make you sound decidedly not contemporary. Um, not that vibrato can't be used, it's, it's freaking awesome when it's used well. Um, and also, another habit is singing through the phrases and over, coasting over the beats mm -hmm. rather than locking into the pocket. The, the example I always give, and I know my clients like get so annoyed with me because I do this one all the time, but the hook to any song is in the rhythm, right? So I always use Irreplaceable by Beyonce as the mm -hmm. example, you know, so that the opening of that song, you know, is just to the left, to the left, mm -hmm. where that mm is placed and how long and how short all of those notes are, that's where the hook is. Mm. If you take the rhythm away from it and just sing it, it just becomes to the left, to the left. Mm. And that is so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> it's not cool. It's not a hook. It's dumb, right? It's just a singer kind of being self-indulgent. So that's an extreme example, but, but I, I hear it all the time. You know, singers who are opening up and trying to do so much with their voice that we're not hearing the lyric, we're not locking in with the beat, we're not moving. Um, so less can really be more in that contemporary world if you've gotten a lot of classical and musical theater training where like more is more often. Yeah, yeah, I even see this, I'm a worship leader at a church and I even see this as I work with singers that are gonna be singing on the worship team and they are classically trained, they're used to singing hymns and they cannot get the rhythmic side. Like right. they think I just sing everything straight or they just don't know that they're singing everything straight or they don't understand the, you know, the offsetting rhythms and things like that. And I'm like, I don't know how to teach them how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just get it naturally. Like if you listen to, to contemporary music, you, you kind of pick it up. But I guess if some people don't, yeah, it's another way reason why I like working with people in a DAW, no matter what you're doing, because then mm. you can see it, right? We can draw it in together in MIDI in your session. Mm. You know what I mean? And then you can literally work to that. You can sing to it, you can practice to it, you can subdivide beats, you know. So rather than hearing it, you're physically creating it, watching yourself do it, and then going in. So you could you could even draw, show them like like this is kind of a triplet feel here. This is what this looks like, and then they could oh interesting. Yeah, I like and that. A lot, of, a lot of songwriters, you know, they're 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 coming from this beautifully organic free association space, and all the best song. We all love that as songwriters when that happens, but then it can help to go back and go, am I syncopating this or not? Because it's sort of halfway in between. Mm. <laughs> really committed with this phrase, you know, what am I actually doing rhythmically here? Or even note wise, what am I doing? It's just a little bit soft and slushy because it came out of me organically, but then you got to go back in and tighten that up. That's true. And a lot of times when they're writing a song, they'll, they'll sing that, that phrase differently every time. It's like, no, oh, what yes. are these notes? <laughs> <laughs> At some point we make a creative decision for the recording. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I like it. Well, gosh, this has been some great information and I love hearing all your expertise that you're able to work with people um, individually in the studio. And is there anything else that you want to, going back to kind of the career side and um, anyone that might contact you after listening or watching this podcast, like what, what do artists nowadays need to really understand or know about the current state of the music industry? 
Well, I think the most important message that I want artists to know today is that you absolutely can create a meaningful music career that doesn't burn you out mm. and break the bank. You, tr you truly can. What that is for you, I wouldn't be an egomaniac enough to say because I don't know you <laughs> and I don't know what creates meaning in your life and what type of career you want, but, but it, can, it can be done. You can create a career that you truly enjoy even in this crazy landscape that we're in right now. Um, and for anyone who wants music industry involvement, please, please, please remember that your path right now needs to be the same exact path as an indie artist in order to get a great opportunity. You need to figure out over the long term, how are you going to write, record, release, create a fan base, create a fan funnel, probably make some money off of it so that it's sustainable for you and get yourself to a pretty successful level before you'll have great industry opportunities. The days of being discovered and funded early on are done. You might get discovered and talked to, which should, be, which should feel great, but getting funded and getting a real deal early in the game is, is kind of done. But it also means that you can outwork everybody. You know, if you have a good work ethic and you really love this and you figure out a solid path, you can do it. You can absolutely do it. Yeah. I'm glad you said that. So people are not waiting around for the magic record deal. Right. And, or, or manager or whoever is going to sweep them off their feet and say that they're going to, you know, pay for everything while they get their crap together. Like that is not, <laughs> that's not happening. So, you know, you need, you need help from people like Melissa to really know what their, you know, what your goals are and what your focus needs to be and who you are as an artist. And then you need help setting up solid business because you are going to be a business. Yeah. Right. Because you, you yeah. need to do, like she said, you need to do all of that stuff before anyone's even going to look at you. And uh, that may be a, a big bummer for some of you that are listening, but it just, that's just how it is right now. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's empowering, though. Yeah, it's so do empowering. I. Some people are just like, oh, this is terrible. Let's go back to the 90s. I'm like, no, because the number of people that actually got to put their music out was so small. Yeah, I I don't miss that. You know, <laughs> I don't miss having zero access to help, acknowledgement, a fan base. You know, I, I do not miss that. It's always been tough, guys. It's always been hard. We should not romanticize the 90s, except maybe some of the music in the clothes, which are coming back anyway. <laughs> That's true. They are. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I know you've got a, a special gift for everyone that's listening or watching. Can you tell them how they can find that and also how they can connect with you uh, more online? Sure, of course. So I created a special link for friends of Brie Noble. It's mastermindroad.com, spelled just like it sounds, like you're on the road to your own mastermind. So it's mastermindroad.com slash register dash Brie. Um, you can also find me on Instagram, music underscore career underscore mastermind. I'm also on TikTok on the same name. Um, and what you'll get when you click on that link is you can register to get my free masterclass, which is called creating your meaningful music career. And also for friends of Brie, you're going to get an invitation from me uh, soon to join a free music career diagnostics workshop where I'll actually take some volunteers and do a little music career diagnostics session with you all. That's very awesome. Well, thank you for that gift. And that will be in the show notes, you guys too, if you can't remember uh, the long <laughs> URL, but, um, <laughs> but definitely go check that out. Connect with Melissa online. And thank you so much, Melissa, for everything you've shared. And I love having this conversation because we have so many of the same views on, on the music industry and, and how musicians can really make the impact and create the legacy that they want in the world. Thank you so much for all you do, Brie. You are a beacon of light for entrepreneurial musicians as we all should be. Um, and I just can't thank you enough. You've been doing great work for a really long time. My audience loves you. They're gonna be so excited that we got to connect. Oh, thanks. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. 
leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.